Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give it a um, minute or two just to um, uh, have the, uh, the last few attendees um, join in. Um, but uh, housekeeping then first, um, uh, this will be the last um, uh, webinar of the year. This recording um, will be available online um, for those um, suffering from insomnia. Um, I'm, I'm going to a little help um, getting off to sleep over the Christmas period. And by all means, uh, rewatch this um, and, uh, um, and it'll be sure to put you to sleep. Um, uh, the copy of the slides will be made available as well. Um, and if there are any questions throughout the session, um, please ask away within the chat box. Um, I will try and answer as we go through. Um, but if not, please ask the questions and I'll be able to follow up um, um, afterwards if there's anything in particular. Um, so there is an, a, a, an awful lot, there's probably 101 things um, that's contained within this. This is a bit of horizon scanning. This is looking um, at the next 12 months um, or 12 to 18 months, looking down the track um, as to what's coming, what we can expect, um, and, um, and really how that's going to impact what it is we do um, and, um, and, and how it is that we do it. Um, so, um, because of the nature of, of, of horizon scanning, there's a part of this that's that, that, that's relatively high level. Um, but one of the things ultimately is to, to start engaging in that conversation and, and ultimately get people preparing um, for um, 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 for what we are seeing coming down the track, or what we know from a legislative or regulatory perspective, um, is a uh, is is on its way. Um, so, um, at a fairly high level things that we're going to, to, to touch on. Um, looking at ESG, um, and um, if you were like me, um, 18 months ago, I, I would struggle to spell it. Um, but now it is um, what, um, um, at, at least in, in conversations had with clients, um, um, one of the hottest topics. Um, really understanding what it is, what it means, um, and, and what our requirements are, um, because um, ESG is, is is now not just another buzzword. It is fundamentally going to change how we um, interact um, with clients and, and the supply chain, um, and the reporting obligations that, that, that come with it. So we're going to look at that touch on really understanding a little bit better as to what it is. Um, and things that we really need to be um, need to be mindful of. Um, we're going to look at from the the industry um, issues of, of professional indemnity, um, and this isn't necessarily new, um, but we are starting to see as the Building Safety Act um, um, continues to evolve and more and more claims as they are associated with liability start to um, um, start to arise um, that PI um, um, is now becoming um, um, even more stressed than perhaps it, it previously was. Um, we're then going to touch on the Procurement Act very briefly. Um, so the um, legislation that will um, in essence replace the current procurement um, regime that we have where we take our public contract or utility or concession regulations um, um, from the EU directives um, and now how um, um, as part of <coughs> the process um, um, and the still evolving process of Brexit continues um, and the impact this will likely have on us. And we're then going to look at advance, uh, advancements um, recently now in retention and whether or not it may become a thing of the past and whether or not um, private members' bills are, 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 are set to be passed. Um, and then look at um, future proofing and, and the short and the medium term issues with, um, with RAC, the, um, the unequipped area of concrete, um, um, and a few other small minor things just to, to, to be mindful of. Um, um, where we look at, as I said, there's 101 different things to, um, to consider. Um, so, um, starting quickly at our, our ESG, so what 
is ESG, what, do, what, what does it mean and what does it mean for us? Well, um, ESG is the acronym for Environmental, Social and, and Governance. Um, so essentially it is um, uh, how we do it, why we do it, which um, we, um, we do um, work, um, whether we tender for it, um, how, how we procure it, um, and how we deliver it. So from an environmental perspective, things that now um, have to be thought about or things that are going to have to change are ultimately the materials that we use, the waste management, the circular economy, the reusing and recycling of um, materials or of products. Now, when designs are being provided, they're whole life design. So it's not a terribly new concept that there would be whole life costs. Um, but that whenever we are engaging in any design, whether as a developer, whether as a designer, whether as a contractor, whether as a consultant, whether as a member of the supply chain, we have to consider um, uh, how these are sustainable, how they can be adapted um, so that in um, 10 years time, 15, 20 years time, we're not considering retrofitting buildings, that there is already um, the ability to um, um, improve, reuse, or recycle um, um, either the products, materials, or the concepts that have been used. Um, now, using, and again, not terribly new with the construction methodology, whether it's modern methods of construction, move towards um, different methodologies that also ties into material use, where we're trying to reduce our embodied carbon, um, and then use of, of technology. This ties in with the likes of the Building Safety Act and the Golden Thread, whether we use blockchain or whether there's technology from an actual construction perspective, about, um, 3D printing, the like. Um, anything that then is to improve um, our environmental, global, or carbon handprint or um, footprint. Um, so all of these things and more, this is just and again, at a relatively high level, um, are things we now must consider um, um, because there will be regulatory and coming down the line legislative regimes that may um, penalise um, um, entities, bodies, contractors, consultants who do not comply with this. Um, um, and, and again, it's, it's one of those um, real serious considerations um, um, at, at the feasibility of, of any project. We then look at our social aspects, that's where we look at the community, that's more of the external focus, um, how the work in which we do, the um, contracts in which we engage, or the manner in which we engage with entities, um, um, reflect the community um, or impact on that community. We we'll look at supply chain management. This is now where there are in existence regulatory frameworks that require us to actually look at our own supply chain, um, um, where we have scope one, scope two, and scope three obligations. So our own internal, um, um, our staff, and then our supply chain members to make sure that we actually are, um, have the oversight or ability to ensure that they are not um, breaching any of the policies which we set out that we've committed to from any um, or to any client or any modern slavery or corruption or entry bribery or money laundering provisions that we must ensure that our own staff are keeping up to speed with this which is generally our um, a, um, a requirement that, 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 that most businesses um, um, adhere to or um, 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 I have checks and balances in place, but now we have to do the same and almost to the same extent with our supply chain. Um, and with that internal focus, it's the social aspects. This is where we look at um, um, inclusion. This is where we look at our corporate social responsibility um, um, and demonstrably. Um, so again, these are these are where there will be measurable targets, key performance indicators or metrics that we then will be marked against. And again, the failure to comply with this or where we get into blue washing for the social aspects, um, where we claim that we have these great diversity and inclusion policies, but then are not actually seeing them through um, or not actually implementing them or we paying lip service to it. Um, um, there, 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 there may be significant or serious consequences. 
governance then is our stakeholder engagement and our responsible tendering. That's basically how we are going to implement the environmental and the social aspects um, and, and, and how we are engaging with clients, how we are engaging um, with our supply chain generally um, and making sure that all of these are actually implemented. So putting it into practice, um, you've got the corporate social uh, uh, corporate corporate sustainability due diligence directive. I'm going to say that ten times strongly. Um, but ultimately, this is EU law, which is going to require companies to identify, mitigate, prevent, um, um, and, and, and bring to life reporting on the impact of their operations and their business relationships on human rights and the environment. Um, no. The idea that this is from the EU Commission does not mean that because of Brexit it will not apply to us. It will apply to member and non-member states and anyone that will have any kind of cross-border input. Now it won't apply to SMEs or micro um, um, uh, micro businesses, but this is now um, a regulatory and legislative framework um, that will actually harmonize all the different directives and all the different requirements into one place. There will be um, uh, penalties um, for non-compliance that will not just be naming and shaming, but you could be barred from uh, particular tenders or for procuring for particular work. Um, um, there could be fines for misreporting um, as opposed to not complying. So again, it's all of the considerations of um, um, our ESG requirements putting into context that there is a regulatory framework that will actually go in some way um, to, uh, to enforce this. Um, so again, whenever you consider um, how green are projects, um, looking at lessons learned um, um, and moving towards net zero. So again, where there are net zero assessments of part of tending for works, whether we're whole life cost as opposed to the cheapest builds, where we're using smart building or modern method of construction and building information modeling. We already talked about blockchain and the gold thread. So again, these are things that we need to, to, to consider whenever we are tendering for work, whenever we are advising clients um, um, on, um, on these projects. Um, it's now a, a major move towards feasibility. Whenever we are um, trying to understand the scope or the applicability of any um, project. When we ask what success looks like, this must be at the forefront of it. Um, and ESG is not just, um, as I said, another buzzword or another acronym that, that, that will fall by the wayside. Um, there is a unified global commitment to this. Um, um, and now that it is being legislated for, um, it's something you have to get up for, uh, to speed with. Now, what we're saying is you don't need to boil the ocean, um, um, and it's about the 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 the, the revolution, not uh, or the evolution, not the revolution. Um, but um, it's it's um, it, it, it it's a real real um, game changer um, um, in in so far as um, um, uh, the built environment. Of applied. Um, what we are already now starting to see in, in, in this in, in, in practice um, are issues of greenwashing. Um, now there are the likes of the NEC uh, a four form of contract um, with X29 that um, puts in place key performance indicators to monitor um, the green credentials or the green commitments that have been made. Um, um, but we have, and there are live clients now where um, clients have accused um, clients of ours um, of potential greenwashing. Now, the rationale and the reasons behind this um, will 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 lead to a different um, a different conversation. Um, but greenwashing, at its heart, are bogus eco claims made by contractors, consultants, developers, anyone within the built environment sector. Essentially, that they are inflating. Um, or um, um, are uplifting any green credentials, either with the purpose of winning a bid, um, um, purpose of in, um, um, gaining um, grants or potential funding, um, or ultimately just to make themselves more attractive in the market. Um, now, the CMA, um, looking at the Green Claims Code, 
um, stated that up to 40% of green claims could be misleading. And that number is, 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 is probably set to rise where there are bodies, consultants or contractors saying, oh, well, here is my um, environmental policy or here is our green initiative, but potentially just empty words. And that's where we're looking at um, not just asking for green policies um, that is putting in place key performance indicators or metrics or ways to measure any green commitment that has been made because of the scope one and scope two requirements and as set out in the corporate sustainability due diligence directive it is not enough merely to ask so i as a client um, will not get away with merely asking a contractor to be more green and have green policies i have to take a step further and make sure that that contractor or that consultant are actually managing um, um, or adhering to the policies or the commitments that they've made to us. My failure to do that will potentially be a breach of these regulations and my, um, of my regulatory obligations. Um, as a contractor, failure to do that again could lead to fines, could potentially in some instances not only lead to damages, um, but termination and again potentially naming and shaming or blackballing um, from a um, from from a, um, from a future competition. So this is not just contractors; this also applies to um, um, consultants or anyone within the built environment sector. So it is it, it's a real root and branch um, of regime change. So again, be aware of it; it is coming. There's nothing we can do to change it. It's about being prepared, and if you are not up to speed with it. Um, look, the amount of text, the amount of, of, of information that is out there, um, even as a starting point, start to look at this. Um, but we have a number of our um, um, uh, um, larger businesses will either have huge uh, ESG strategies or now putting in place sustainability directors or ESG directors um, and reporting into the board, um, or they are now board members. This is not something that you can ignore. Um, um, and it is dramatically going to change how we work, how we win work, um, 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 and how we report on that. Moving on to the next stage now um, is our PI crisis and the question as to whether or not we are in the midst of a PI crisis. And CLC um, um, last year um, set out some um, findings um, which um, Really have 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 only got um, have only got um, worse. Um, so the question essentially was whether or not, from a professional indemnity expe uh, um, um, uh, expectation, um, too much was being asked for. Um, question as to whether or not actually more should be expected from um, clients to work with um, contractors when it comes to issues of liability and insurance and indemnity. Um, again, for anyone that has ever um, attended any of my back to basic sessions, they'll know the difference or distinction between insurance, liability and indemnity. Insurance is the abstract pot of money, whether or not it exists, the premium that a, a, a body will pay or an entity will pay to potentially gain access to that. Liability is a fancy word for responsibility, whether or not there is actually a, a, a liability, a, a, an obligation to provide something. And indemnity is a strict question as to whether something has or has not happened. Um, and if indemnity is provided, um, in the first instance, the question is not one of blame or responsibility, that's liability. Indemnity is merely a question of fact as to whether this breach or this event has occurred. And if it has, that the party providing the indemnity um, will have given up um, um, or allowed access to that sum of money, which is why a lot of underwriters um, um, or insurers or reinsurers aren't terribly um, happy with indemnities. So again, it's whether or not we need to move away from asking for those certain indemnities um, and actually um, proactively um, working together such that insurance is not going to be affected. Um, and the um, um, looking at the fallout of, 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 of Grenfell, now with the Building Safety Act, um, and the, in, the, the increasing difficulty 
um, in achieving um, um, or obtaining a lot of the professional indemnity insurance that's been asked for. Uh, a lot of insurers moving out of the market um, um, has now created a bit of more of an, um, a monopoly um, and the premiums just getting that bit higher. So again, ways in which this is affecting us. Well, whether or not we're acting, uh, asking for fitness for purpose and comparing that to reasonable skill and care. So reasonable skill and care, the lower threshold, fitness for purpose again, moving into that strict liability, it either is or is not fit for purpose. Um, and obviously we've got our Hogarth and Eon case, the Supreme Court, that said that two of these are not mutually exclusive. The test for fitness for purposes be whether or not there is a prescribed criteria um, within any contract, that prescribed criteria, whether it's a design life, whether it's um, a functionality a requirement, potentially can inadvertently provide a fit for purpose obligation. So again, it's whether or not we need to start excluding fitness or purpose or whether or not um, from a professional indemnity perspective, it would be better to have a consultant or a contractor argue the point on reasonable skill and care as opposed to asking for fitness for purpose and not being able to ensure um, or, or avail of any insurance. Um, again, moving away from an unlimited liability will definitely help. Unlimited liability in some instances um, um, can go um, 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 as far as voiding um, some insurance policies or some underwriting policies. Um, I'm asking again for achievable levels, so not asking for um, um, uh, professional indemnity levels that are far beyond what um, um, what is actually required, and whether or not um, capping this at 200% um, of the contract value um, or the scoped value, whatever that might be, might be a more appropriate way. Um, deciding whether or not design and build or develop and constructing is what we actually want. So again, design and build is where we would give the contractor um, um, certain autonomy to go out, design and build, where we would um, be largely output based. Basically, we ask for something, we then give the contractor um, free reign um, in a design and build um, um, uh, um, contract to go out and achieve those outputs. Whereas development construct, we are more input based. We essentially want to keep having that input. Um, and we ask the contractor to input to this to ensure that we can achieve what it is that we want. Um, so again, understanding the distinction and understanding what it is that we want, because it could be um, that you pay a premium for that design and build, um, or where we have a development construct contract, but we want the contractor to take all the risk, design and build contractor to take all the risk. Of everything that had happened prior. Um, looking at bonds as alternative or different project level insurances. So there's different um, ways and means as opposed to increasing the level of insurance of other forms of security, whether again they could be collateral warranties from all the major subcontractors, um, whether or not um, it is retention bonds, whether or not they're performance bonds, whether they're guarantees that can be provided either from a parent company, a sister company, um, um, or, a, or, or bank bonds as well. Project level insurance where actually the parties can work together um, and certainly for large development we are seeing this more and more where the actual clients themselves are willing to contribute to the premium, not adding to the contractor's overall PI insurance, but both parties um, paying in for what would amount to the all risk insurance for the successful development of any property. Um, so again, um, insurance brought out in both names uh, where premiums are contributed by both parties. And again, one of the things that can always be considered um, is if the contractor um, or the consultant is maintaining that insurance, if there is an uplift um, that the client themselves makes a contingency to contribute to that premium. So again, we are on the cusp of a PI crisis that actually it is becoming harder and harder or more expensive to insure. So we have to start thinking about novel ways um, to collaborate um, and work together. It's, it is about finding a solution not merely complaining about the problem. Um, so on that, yes, we are in the midst. It's what we... Now on to the Procurement Act. So what is the Procurement Act? As I said, <clears throat> it is to um, consolidate and essentially replace 
um, um, the regulations or the EU directives. Um, it was to make procurement simpler, quicker, more transparent and less bureaucratic. Now, whether or not that has actually been achieved or will be achieved is still subject to be seen. Um, the Procurement Act replaces the public contract um, 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 of PCR regulations, the utility contract regulations, the concession contract regulations, um, and the defence and security regulations. So the Procurement Act now replaces each of these bits of legislation, um, coalesces, um, um, uh, uh, consolidates them all um, in a way that is meant to be or meant to deliver more efficiencies. So there's principles that are very similar um, um, to the European um, directives that were then just adopted um, as our um, um, public contract regulations and utility regulations and then um, 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 increased upon or, or actually further supplemented. Um, but it, it is more of a move back to competition law, um, but codifying that, putting it in, in, in a structured form. Now, it's going to apply in England to begin with, um, with the devolved authorities of Wales and Northern Ireland um, um, giving the invitation then to adopt this just wholesale. Um, Scotland opted out of this new um, um, procurement regime, but will maintain its own legal um, framework. Um, so with the Procurement Act, um, there will be right now a, 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 um, a, a, not a disconnect, but there will be, depending on the um, regions within the United Kingdom, um, there will for a period be very different um, um, procurement regimes or, or, or regulations, um, look, such as the devolved powers um, given through, um, um, through it. So it's going to come into force. Um, um, uh, um, so it has gained royal assent, so it is now um, law coming into force um, likely to be enforced in the summer of next year. Um, um, but there is going to be a transition period, not going to um, immediately just oust um, uh, current regulations that have um, uh, our current procurements that are using um, the current existing frameworks or regulations, there will be a period in which um, um, those contracts will be phased out. And contracts that have been entered into on those basis will continue in effect applying those principles. Um, and there will be a transition period when they will um, essentially expire or when the new principles will be transposed. But there are going to be growing pains and there's going to be this issue of the competing factions here. Um, well, what are the principles? Well, um, um, the European principles of um, equal treatment, non-discrimination, proportionality um, and transparency um, don't really move, but they fo are focused slightly differently through principles and considerations. The principles are value for money. That's number one. The procurement process is to ensure value for money. Now, value for money can be interpreted in many different ways. Is value for money the whole life cost of that asset, which is really going back to the ESG consideration? Um, or are we setting this up for, if this isn't regulated properly, to encourage races to the bottom because well, my excuse as a contracting authority is value for money. Well, value for money, is that the cheapest? Um, and we know that the answer is that it's not the cheapest, but I'm the contracting authority with a particular budget that I have to spend, or I'm advising that contracting authority. Um, uh, it, it, it may breed that culture, um, um, if not regulated properly. Now, a big part of this is maximizing the public benefit. Um, sharing information with suppliers and others to understand the procurement policy and decisions, why we've come up with that, and then acting and being seen to act with integrity. So those are the principles. Value for money, public benefit, information sharing and gathering, and then acting with integrity. So again, it's where these principles can't conflict with the other. The value for money um, um, does not mean a race to the bottom because surely that cannot be us acting with integrity. But um, it's the brave new world. Um, it's it's um, it's going to make procurement lawyers and potentially dispute lawyers 
a lot of money in the next few years trying to tease out um, um, how this is going to work in, in practice. The considerations then are we treat suppliers the same unless a difference justifies not. We take reasonable steps to ensure no supplier is treated unfairly unless there is a reason that they are not treated the same. Um, so these two <coughs> um, look at the equal treatment of the non-discrimination point, but then they very carefully caveat it to say, I will treat all suppliers, all tenderers in the same way, unless I have a valid reason why not to. So I will treat all suppliers the same unless only one supplier can provide what it is I'm looking for. And because of that, I will go to them. Um, um, so again, it, it gives wiggle room to contracting authorities, which most will welcome but potentially it's going to raise challenges because we need to test this. Um, it's, it's similar to the Building Safety Act as, as the two major bits of legislation that have come out from, um, um, from Parliament recently. Um, that it's going to have to evolve. There's going to have to be clarifications given to this because whilst it is fantastic in principle, in practice, we're kind of watching this space, um, but there is a lot of flexibility, um, but inflexibility become gray areas. Um, and within those 50 shades of gray are where, as I said, the procurement lawyers, the speech lawyers are potentially um, really going to have to rely upon um, how, uh, how this was intended to be interpreted. The last bit of the considerations is there has to be proper regard to uh, small medium enterprises. Um, so the SMEs, there cannot be a barrier to participation. So in the back of contracting authorities' minds, there should always be how can we properly engage with and how can we um, and potentially split up contracts to um, um, to bring SMEs to uh, to the party. Concession contracts will also change. So it's not just the public contract detail regulations, but also through the concession contracts. And there's a procedure and policies and a regime being put in place for how concession contracts will be let and and essentially what they will now look like. The procedure is where we had the competitive dialogue, um, restricted with negotiation, the open procedures were one stage, two stage. We've got our open procedure, the single stage, there you go, our PQQ and ITT at the same time, and then the com competitive flexible procedure. So um, where we'll look at competitive dialogue or negotiation where there will be two stages where there's a lot of, again, flexibility, there's movement within this. Um, but that flexibility that contracting authorities have been granted really needs to be within a, a regulated regime because otherwise it becomes the Wild West. Um, now, it is likely that in the first few years, um, there will only be a few test cases to push this and see just how far it goes. And the courts will probably give us, or any clarification from government will probably um, um, help us align how this is meant to work. Um, but, uh, but a more risk averse is likely, uh, a risk averse approach is likely what we're going to see. We're going to follow largely what, um, what, what, what happened. Remedies don't really change that much. Yes, we, we go back into competition law, but the remedies for um, uh, um, the court now to enforce certain specific performance, again, at grant injunctions, um, not much has changed. It's the manner in which we go about um, ultimately, stopping something to be awarding, uh, awarded, ensuring something's going to be awarded. <coughs> um, but the 30 day time frame um, of whenever we should have become aware um, hasn't really changed um, um, in, in, any, in any great way. And then the notices, again, not trying to depart too far from what, what is known practice, um, but the time frames, the notices for when um, information needs to be shared goes back to those principles. So we're not, this is the transparency point um, and prior information notices as well. So again, we're not changing that much. There's subtle changes as, as it applies to remedies and notices, um, but, um, but it's just about um, what's to get in. Um, finally, or well, not finally, but, but moving on then, um, 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 as the um, legislative changes that we're now trying to see, um, is potentially looking at retention. So again, looking at last year, about 5% of the contracts um, half of, um, 
artifact completion half after the making good or the defect certificate is issued, um, 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 whatever the contract may be, um, works as and that insurance policy for build quality. So it's not about the actual performance security, it's an insurance policy for build, because if you have a pump, you should well, we'll hold on to that retention. Um, now, why this is becoming more and more um, significant within the industry um, is largely down to um, the cusp of the recession that we sit on, the margins that are being squeezed in the construction industry um, and major contractors, um, tier one contractors going pop um, um, from a cash flow and a, a, an economy perspective. Um, it's about 4.5 billion annually that's not being circulated back into the economy. It's not being paid to suppliers. Therefore, it's not being paid to individuals. Therefore, it's not being paid on the high street. So that's at the macro and the micro level that we're seeing the impact on, on, on the UK's economy uh, because of this. You look at then the amount of actual retention being um, held. Um, 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 you know, there were you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions um, um, billions within the industry being lost um, um, because of contractors going into administration and that ret those retention amounts being evaporated um, because a contractor goes into administration, that contractor has a number of secured creditors. Well, there are 20, 50, 100 different suppliers or subcontractors where there is 5,000, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 held in retention that they will never see. Um, that then impacts the entire supply chain. It's been used and abused, um, and retention in and of itself um, um, can amount to up to 10% of the construction industry's turnover. Um, is the failure of that retention being cycled back into um, uh, to the supply chain? So again, where there were private members bills even a few years ago and starting to gain traction, you look at the construction retention deposit schemes and the private members construction retention abolition bill, where now going through construction consultation, um, um, the changes either to I'm amending the housing grants construction unit, which I don't think will happen in, in the way in which it's suggested, um, will either lead to one of two things. Um, and they are coming in, in in some regard that either retention will now have to be held on trust so if a company does go into administration the retention sum is ring fenced and will then um, 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 uh, be made available um, to, um, um, to to that body to that subcontractor that supplier um, it could be that retention in and of itself is abolished um, and there are some suggestions that even retention that is currently outstanding um, be paid. Now, I don't think that will happen. Um, I think I think the shockwaves would be far too great. Um, but there is <coughs> um, a real focus um, on stopping retention, which can be seen as quite archaic. Um, <coughs> replacing retention bonds um, 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 that are paid jointly between the parties if there is an issue of of of, of, of still requiring this insurance policy. Um, but why should I have 5% of the monies that I am um, um, owed be held because of an issue of service? It should be better management that you just don't pay me in the first place for work that I then have not completed. And this is where we get into um, uh, the likes of the NEC contract model, where you look at an option A, where you only pay the amount of works completed, free of defects that are going to prohibit others doing the works with a client putting the work into use. Um, so um, each month we monitor that. And again, one of the reasons why retention is a secondary option as it comes to the NEC, you have to add that in. So again, it could be moving more towards that model, um, or it could be actually more of a government emphasis, even further than it has already, to use the NEC um, um, and, uh, and, and properly administer retention Um, moving on then to one of the practical implications um, 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 for, um, um, for, for, for 
reinforced area that is typically uh, concrete, which we um, now are seeing more of a political and a topical issue. Um, you know, there's schools where 214 schools have been closed. Um, but again, short term, the whole point of RAC was, was, was not to panic. Um, you know, these issues are not new. Um, you know, risks were identified way back in the 1960s and safety concerns um, were raised um, as far back as the 1980s. Um, uh, we give a, 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 a webinar, a few webinars on, on, on RAC um, um, over the last few weeks. Um, and um, there are people who have um, been born, grown up, um, gone to law school, um, qualified as solicitors and are currently working at DWF um, in the time that the design life of certain RAC buildings has expired. So it, it expired, and then the person who was born grew up the, 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 the David Copperfield um, um, and is now currently working advising on these topics. Um, now, this is not to say that you can't ignore it. You look at appointing um, a surveyor as soon as possible, checking your contracts. Um, but in terms of, of the issues with RAC, the, the whole issue was not to panic. Potentially, this is more of a political issue as to why it's in the zeitgeist and why it is so important. Um, but the, the main crux was um, getting a building surveyor appointed um, where appropriate. Um, now, the government guidance you know, hasn't really been clear. There's been certain things from the HSE, certain things from the Department um, for Education, um, where um, really this became more of a political issue. Um, but prioritizing buildings into that high, medium and low um, um, is, is, is what's important. But in a modern regime, because surveying doesn't solve the problem, you're going to have to put in a regime for plan prevent maintenance surveys, um, or in the worst high risk or medium risk, um, carrying out remedial works, them happening as soon as possible, or understanding costs or what the, the impact um, on, on, on the building um, or the asset actually is. Um, now we always say um, when it comes to issues of RAC in properties um, to involve um, an asbestos consultant at the same time because it tended to be that the area of the concrete was used at the same time as asbestos was used um, um, as insulation um, and um, often we have or we have started to see surveyors coming in and, and monitoring buildings and then saying oh, well we found asbestos here as well or not understanding that asbestos was present and the real risk is potential asbestos breaches um, whenever carrying out these remedial works. Now that causes another problem because the actual um, uh, um, supply chain, the actual availability of those specialists um, um, is, uh, um, is, 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 is lacking, is, 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 is not, um, it's not great. Um, so it's about keeping calm, not panicking, but carrying out surveys, identifying high, medium and low risk buildings, and then considering what implications this is going to have on the increase of premiums on insurance or basically selling the buildings um, a decrease in, in the value of the property. Um, and where we see it from a claims perspective, uh, because of the life cycle and because of um, whilst the Defective Premises Act um, uh, limitation of liability will have been extended, um, these are going to have to be your high risk buildings um, or um, they're going to have to be issues of design um, 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 or workmanship it's not the use of rack it's the fact that they weren't designed or installed properly and that's going to be very hard um, to prove the claims that we're starting to see are from building surveyors who did not identify rack as a problem when they probably should have because this is not a new issue it's becoming a lot more political now and it's in the news an awful lot but this isn't a new issue to the industry and it's whether or not surveyors had inappropriately or inadequately um, advised on the value of an asset or value of a property um, um, that is now much less than, than, than what someone has paid for it. Um, so that's where we're starting to see um, things come. Well, what's next? Um, well, here is just a, you know, and this is not the scaremonger, this is just the horizon scanning of what the next rack because uh, again, this isn't the next cladding, this isn't the next asbestos issue. Um, but what are we seeing 
um, as, uh, as, as, uh, um, as potential risks coming down the line or, or, or potentially um, where there is um, um, innovation and that innovation introduces risk um, um, and certainly whenever a lot of properties now are being retrofitted. Um, you look at the high uh, aluminum cement, the, uh, the lattice framing, um, um, the um, use of large panel uh, system buildings, and again, for, 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 for those that will remember Ronan Point, um, uh, and the impacts that uh, timber buildings, again, always um, having history of, of timber buildings and even light uh, lightweight steel con uh, that, uh, lightweight steel frame buildings. Um, real um, um, issues of moving away from the embodied carbon, but putting more risk on the actual installation and the, and the maintenance um, of these um, of these assets. Um, um, and more often than not, when you look at timber or, or lightweight steel frame buildings, um, it's more to do with the asset management that causes um, um, causes a, causes the most issues. You then got your glass inclusion. Now, again, nickel sulfate inclusions are not sandblasting. Um, um, toughened glass um, is, is nothing new, um, but is um, something that is um, a, a, again becoming a bit more um, commonplace now. Um, um, and, and it is from an insurance or an actuarial perspective trying to understand why that is. Now, the lithium ion batteries. Um, so, what we are looking at here is EV charging um, or, or electric vehicles. Um, you look at Luton Airport as an example. Now, whilst it was a diesel car that went on fire, um, um, it's the introduction of ion, uh, um, lithium ion batteries um, that potentially causes or contributes to the spread of this. Um, so, putting this in, in real world terms and an actual alive example, um, you cannot extinguish a lithium battery the same way you would. A diesel or a petrol car. Again, it's the combustible and the flammable nature of, of, of those. And again, the difference between diesel and petrol anyway, I'll not pull on. But these are like a this is the chip pan fire analogy. Um, um, these are not fires that can easily be contained. And there's now real risks that we are seeing for EV charging points beside buildings or what is now becoming much more alarming to people in basement car parks. Um, why? Because if you have five EV charging points in a basement underground car park that is not easily accessible to a fire department, you are potentially creating um, where a fire would start in one, would easily spread to the other, and is not something that is going to be put out. And the flames um, and the heat that's generated from this is quite extreme. And you're putting that in a basement car park. Um, um, the impact that will have from an insurance and actuarial perspective, people are getting very worried about this. Um, and it's a very negative thing to then be looking at whenever you're looking at moving towards net zero and the introduction and the use of, um, of electric vehicles. But they're not, um, they're not without risk. Um, and, and thinking that they are the answer is, 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 is maybe not the most popular opinion, but, but again, looking at what is coming down the line. Um, are you advising a client? Is the client considering um, um, this? And, and have we actually thought about whether or not this is safe, appropriate, or even insurable? And again, these are the things we're trying to, uh, to, see, uh, to see come about. Come the track. So again, um, looking at um, other updates, they, they, they and many Climate Commitment Disclosure, which again ties in with their ESG. For companies with over 500 people, the company strategic report regulations are now going to have to set targets. So clients um, or companies are going to have to set out how they are going to manage climate-related risks and opportunities. Failure to do this, again, can be being blackballed, can be being fined. Are we can, uh, adhering to our disclosure obligations? And again, where we have uh, material fluctuations and force majeure, you looked at COVID, Brexit, and Ukraine, it's now future proofing for that. What is the next COVID, Brexit, or Ukraine? Um, um, are we actually aligned for this whenever we are contracting? Are we pricing the risk of these, um, of, of these unknowns? Because force majeure doesn't exist as a right in the UK. It doesn't exist as a right in common law. It has to be contractually included 
in the UK. Some contracts have it, some contracts don't. So compare the NEC. The NEC does not have force majeure, but it has prevention, which means the client takes the risk and time and money of an event that would traditionally be force majeure. The ACT has force majeure, means the client um, 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 is only responsible for the time-related aspects, but not the lost expense. So again, considering whenever we are contracting or whenever we're advising um, um, or procuring these um, these uh, um, these um, these issues. Look at corporate manslaughter, and again, no um, um, uh, uh, changes in stricter sentencing for health and safety breaches. So again, this is where the HSC um, becomes involved, looking at fines up to ten million where there are serious injuries or deaths um, on site. Um, and again, why it ties into our social and governance aspects of ESG, um, um, there are much more significant fines and penalties coming um, um, where because of somebody's negligence or somebody's failure to act, um, they are held um, 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 potentially as a business responsible for um, the, um, uh, um, the death of an individual. And again, looking at liability of consultants, um, 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 now this comes into the status of collateral warranties and as um, construction contracts. Um, but now what we are seeing from a consultant's perspective um, is more and more smashing grabs occurring, causing consultants to be liable for not issuing certificates or pay less notices on time. So as a the technicality, I had to pay the contractor X amount but that was only because you, the consultant, did not manage the contract um, adequately. Again, these are things that we're now um, starting to see more and more of. And this then ties back into a professional indemnity um, um, of question or, 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 or work. And then finally, the very last thing again, um, we're seeing more and more claims coming for um, uh, clients. Um, that are not our uh, main contractors or consultancy or sub consulting work um, that are having interest rates for late payment less than 2%. And again, it is not allowed to be less than 2%. If it is, it will um, be potentially classed as a penalty. Um, and the Late Payment and Commercial Debts Interest Act will apply, meaning it'll be 8% over the Bank of England base rate. Let's say the Bank of England base rate at the minute is um, 10%. That's 18% you're paying uh, because you put in zero or put in one. Um, and again, this is per annum, 2% per annum, not per month, not per week, 2% per annum. It cannot be less than 2% per annum. Um, and again, we are just starting to see, and whether or not it is the supply chain becoming more informed about this, um, but it is more and more claims and why it becomes such a risk now is as interest rates, whilst inflation comes down, interest rates, um, you know, remain stubbornly high. And it's one of those worries that it's just going to affect us for the next, let's say 12 to 18 months. So again, you're not being clever by putting in um, um, a rate less than 2% um, 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 as it will be deemed um, a, 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 a penalty. And again, if you do not put in a specific interest rate, um, 8% will default um, on the late payment commercial debt interest act. And that, uh, you know, at, at, at the highest level and running through a bit of horizon scanning, what is coming down the line of what we can expect. Um, so, look, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour um, to run through everything. Um, and as I said, um, at the start, in terms of housekeeping, the slide will be available, this recording will be available online. Um, um, and if there are any questions, please do ask, please do send um, across. Feedback or any information um, that we have on any of the topics um, discussed um, today. Um, so, um, look, I want to thank you all. Um, 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 I'm wishing you all a um, um, uh, uh, happy holiday um, and um, um, we'll see you again in the new year for, um, um, for, for, for another one of these sessions. Um, so, all, I'll depart now um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and thanks very much.